Friday, October the 2nd, 1970, a chartered Martin 404 crashed into the side of a Colorado mountain eight miles west of Silver Plume. On board were 37 passengers. 29 died at the scene, and later, two others died in the hospital. This memorial is located on the grounds of WSU, Wichita State University, and honors those who perished in the crash. This is a very peaceful and quiet place. Every year on October 2nd at 9 a.m., there's a memorial service that is held to honor those that were lost in this crash. Two planes left Wichita on October 2nd. One was dubbed the Black Plane, and one was dubbed, codenamed, the Gold Plane. The Gold Plane carried the starters of the WSU football team, along with the coaches and some other dignitaries. The Black Plane carried the remainder of the football team. They landed in Stapleton International Airport in Denver, Colorado to refuel. After refueling and subsequent startup, the plane was estimated to be over 5,000 pounds over the max gross weight. So what happened? The first officer, Ron Skipper, who was also president and CEO of Golden Eagle Aviation, was acting as the pilot. Ron Skipper decided to take a scenic route along the way of the Rocky Mountains instead of the route going north and around the Rockies into Logan, Utah to give the team a view of the mountains. Had Ron Skipper studied the VFR sectional charts from a navigational point of view versus a sightseeing point of view, he would have saw that they would have needed at least 12,000 feet to clear the peaks of the mountains in the Loveland Pass area. They were flying at approximately 11,000 feet. And the Martin 404 climb gradient was roughly 200 to 200 feet per mile to climb. And so 1,000 feet would have needed over right. four, four miles. By the time they realized there was a problem, there was, there was no out. The, yeah. There was no way to turn around. Yeah. There was no way to go over. Yeah, it, it you know, so they, they, they literally put themselves in a box canyon with virtually zero options. There, there just didn't seem to be any viable option because the, the point of view of needing four miles to be able to climb another thousand feet once they turned, there was only two to three miles that they had right. uh, when they saw the Continental Divide in front of them. Now, it should be noted that Ron Skipper is not type rated on the Martin 404, and he didn't give specific directions or indications of the route to Dan Crocker. This puts the pilot, Dan Crocker, in a very precarious situation. He, he is pilot in command but he reports to Ron Skipper, who is the president of, of the company. Now, they're the operator, although that has garnished some heated discussions between Golden Eagle uh, Aviation and WSU. Golden Eagle, after the fact, claimed that WSU was the operator of the aircraft, and WSU, rightfully so, says, no, we chartered, chartered. the aircraft. Yeah. And that, that would make more sense. Along the scenic route, Ron Skipper, at the controls, was flying approximately 1,600 feet below the mountain peaks. You're going to see in the crash site that once they realized they were in a box canyon and didn't have sufficient distance or time to climb above the mountain peaks, at least Dan Crocker realized that and took the controls away from Ron Skipper to at least attempt to save the aircraft right. and the passenger. There's some debate on the bank angle. And with a bank angle of 60 degrees in excess of 140 knots, the turn radius would have been roughly 1,500 feet. But at that bank angle, and some said was upwards of 60 degrees, Although Ron Skipper denies this because he survived the crash and said it was a gradual 30, maybe 40 degree bank. But 
when you're looking at the side of a mountain that has a 30 or so degree rise, I, I, I think it gives you a, a false sense of an artificial horizon where you think you're not banking as hard as you are. Right. And subsequently, at, at, at bank angles of greater than 30 or 45 degrees, and again, some say 60 degrees, the plane simply stalled. It stalled. And survivors of the aircraft testified there was a violent shaking of, of the aircraft. Subsequent NTSB reports and analysis of the engines show that the engines were not uh, at fault for this. However, even at max power at a 60 degree bank, they would have they couldn't have held altitude. They would they would have right. lost altitude right. in three to three hundred feet per minute. Uh, range. At the initial impact, quite a few of the um, passengers survived. Yeah, the, the, the cabin remained relatively intact. Correct. And quite a few were able to exit the aircraft. Some wanted to try to help some of the other passengers who were trapped. But within just a few minutes, the airplane, which was full of fuel, caught fire, and those that possibly could have been rescued um, perished in the subsequent fire. Probable cause for this accident, AQP number 12, loss of speed awareness. As they were flying through the valley on their sightseeing tour, when they came to this point here is when they realized they were in a box canyon. This is where they started to initiate a course reversal by first banking to the right to get as much radius of a turn as they could and then as they turn to the left I believe that's when the steep bank angle of approximately 60 degrees was achieved and at that point I believe Dan Crocker took the controls to try to lessen that bank angle but if you recall they were 5,000 pounds overweight in traveling slow, probably below DMMS, which is the defined minimum maneuvering speed for the aircraft, and at that point they simply stalled. Could a course reversal be achieved? Possibly, maybe not likely under the conditions of their slow speed and being overweight. We will never know. First officer, Ronald Skipper, attempted to blame this dreadful lack of planning on the late Captain Crocker because he technically was the pilot in command. However, survivors' recollections of the conversations between Skipper and several passengers during the first leg of the flight revealed that it was Skipper's idea to fly up into the Clear Creek Valley. Furthermore, Crocker was only given the position of captain because he was the only one that had the type rating on the 404, which Skipper lacked. So while Crocker was the du jour commander, Ron Skipper was notably his senior and was also the company president, meaning that in practice, Ron Skipper was the one calling the shots. And certainly, Crocker would have been unlikely to question the decisions of the man responsible for his paychecks. In the community of Wichita, this crash is fairly well known. The, the, the sad state of affairs is it did not receive any kind of notoriety over what happened because 43 days after the WSU crash, another plane carrying football players, 75 souls on board, crashed and they all perished. And Hollywood made a movie about it. The movie, We Are Marshall, just seemed to kind of eclipse the WSU tragedy and we're going to take this hike up to the crash site and, and just show it's been over 50 years. Right. And it's, and it's quite amazing how it almost appears to be a time capsule. It does.
fly up here, it's noticeably thinner. Yeah. No, there's no air up here. This is the valley that the gold plane entered flying from east to a westerly direction. And this is the view that the pilots saw from the cockpit when they realized they were in a boxed-in canyon.
Marvin Brown, 19 years old, from the small town of Solomon, Kansas, and they named the football field after him in his honor. Don Christian has the honor of having a scholarship named after him at Wichita State University. John Duran from Oklahoma City, family said that his mother has never recovered from losing her son during that fatal crash. Ron Johnson's father, at the age of 83, took the hike to the crash site, and he says he will never do it again. Randy Keesaw from Clinton, Oklahoma, now has an award that is given out to the player who contributes the most to the team in his honor. Mal Kimmel, whose wife was pregnant at the time of the crash, gave birth to their daughter, Valerie, just four months later. Carl Kruger from the Chicago area has a park named after him in Hickory Hills, Illinois in his honor. Steve Moore was inducted into his high school hall of fame in Derby, Kansas, just south of Wichita. Tom Owen had a scholarship to attend WSU and today there's a scholarship in his name at the university as well. Eugene Robinson, only 21 years old when he died on that side of that mountain, also has a scholarship in his name at WSU. As fate would have it, Tom Shedden had lost his starting position and wasn't even supposed to be on the plane that crashed, but the seating charts were never updated. Richard Steins from Kansas City, Kansas, only 19 years old when he died on that fateful day on that mountainside. John Taylor of Sherman, Texas, survived the crash. He later succumbed to his injuries at the hospital. Jack Vetter from McPherson, Kansas, his brother frequents the crash site to spend time where his 21-year-old brother died. Wichita Athletic Director Burke Katzenmeyer and his wife Marion also died in the crash. Wichita coach Ben Wilson and his wife Helen were also on board the plane on that fatal day. Tom Reeves, the team's trainer for seven years, died three days later in the hospital after succumbing to his injuries of the crash. Marty Harrison, the team manager, was only 19 years old and was looking forward to spending time at the WSU Athletics Department. Carl Farbaugh, Dean of Emissions, earned a Purple Heart at the Battle of the Bulge. He also perished on that fatal day. Floyd Farmer, the ticket manager, also perished that fatal day and there's a scholarship in his honor at WSU as well. Ray Coleman and his wife Maxine also perished that day. They were big Shocker Booster fans and supported the team any way they could. John Grooms and his wife Etta Mae won tickets on the flight for selling the most Shocker Booster memberships. Raymond King, Kansas State lawmaker, along with his wife Yvonne, perished that day, leaving behind seven children. Dan Crocker, pilot, his last efforts was an attempt to save the aircraft and the passengers. Judy Dunn, flight attendant, also perished on the side of that mountain that fateful day. Judy Lane was also a flight attendant but it's not clear if she was actually employed or just along for the ride. 